The year is 1961, and across the globe, a technological race of epic proportions is taking place. The lonely, vast gulf of space. It's infinite and mostly empty, but today, in this particular patch of void, a spacecraft is flying through. It's on its way to fulfill a special mission, to put a human on the moon for the very first time. Now, it silently zips towards the lunar surface, and on its side is the flag of its mother nation, the Soviet Union. Of course, this didn't actually happen. The first person to walk on the moon was an American. But if I told you that fact way back in the early 1960s, you would have been shocked, because initially it looked like it was the Soviets who would be the first to pull off the feat. They'd had a huge run of successes, and America had fallen behind in the race for interstellar dominance. So how did the USA beat the Soviets to the moon? Well, hello time travelers, I'm your friend, Mike Brady, and today, let's find out what doomed the Soviet moon program. At the end of the Second World War, the world was divided into two spheres. The capitalist Western world, led by the United States, and the communist Eastern world, led by the Soviet Union. Well, the ideological conflict between the two had been temporarily put aside for the sake of defeating the Nazis, but relations collapsed almost as soon as the war was over, as both sides wanted to rebuild the world in their own image. And the competition between the two spilled over into all areas of life. The economics, political, military, of course, Scientific. In the 1960s, this competition had morphed into what has become known as the space race, where both the Soviet Union and the United States attempted to land on the moon in order to cement their scientific dominance and secure a future in space. Now, the quest for space exploration sounds like a noble undertaking that all of humankind could benefit from, sure but you might be surprised to know that the origins of the space race could be found in the rapid development of weapons of war. During the Second World War, attempts were made by all sides to develop self-guided missiles. This eventually morphed into finding ways to guide atomic weapons, and once the Soviets had nukes as well, the race was on. The explosion pun intended, of missile and rocket technology after the war soon brought hidden benefits. Our missile systems could be used not just to carry weapons of war, but to put man-made objects into space to orbit around our planet. Now, to be the very first to do so would bring scientific glory to the nation that could pull it off, and both the US and the Soviet Union were keen to snatch the victory, so the space race was afoot. Now, out of the gate, the Soviet Union won early success. One of their earliest converted missile platforms was the R-7 Semyorka, which was the world's first intercontinental ballistic missile. Now, this thing was an absolute beast, 37 meters or 121 feet tall, and coming in at 280 tons. It was such an influential piece of technology for the Soviets that it launched its own family of rockets, and some are still in use to this day. It could carry a 5 megaton nuclear warhead some 8,800 kilometers or 5,500 miles. But with a little modification, the Soviets realized that it could carry a very different payload straight up and into space. In 1957, the Soviet Union succeeded in what would be humanity's first step among the stars and would usher in the dawn of a new era. A modified R-7 rocket was loaded with a small chrome ball and blasted off from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. That wasn't just any old chrome ball though, it was the first satellite, Sputnik 1, and its launch created a sensation back here on Earth. Although some aspects of the launch failed, the satellite was able to successfully enter low Earth orbit and stayed in space for over three weeks. Now the point of Sputnik was to prove that the technology existed to place a satellite in orbit to test the conditions in the atmosphere and to test radio communication and tracking to a man-made object up in the sky. Now the satellite could be seen traversing the sky all across the world, and anybody with a radio could tune in and listen to the beep beep that it was sending back to Earth. The launch of Sputnik put a panic amongst the American government and population because it was apparent that the Soviet Union was pulling ahead in technological development. And on the day of the launch, an NBC announcer played the broadcast of the satellite's radio signal, calling it the sound that forever separates the old world from the new. Now, 
the space race had truly begun and the Americans would be scrambling to catch up for almost the next decade. The next great Soviet success in space came from the launch of Laika the dog, who became the first living creature to make it into space and the first to complete a full orbit of the planet. She was launched on the 3rd of November 1957, only shortly after the successful launch of Sputnik, and the capsule that had been designed to hold Laika was completed on a political rather than scientific schedule, and so it wasn't able to successfully keep Laika alive for more than a short period of time in orbit. But nevertheless, Laika was the first living creature to successfully orbit the planet, and though she was killed earlier in the effort than expected, the mission was considered another success for the Soviet Union and the USA bristled. Now, Laika, a stray dog from the streets of Moscow, became the first real space traveler to come from Earth. And while the Soviets were ticking off achievements, the USA was doing its own thing. In January 1961, NASA sent the first primate into space, a chimp named Han. This was obviously a test for future human spaceflight missions, and it was crucial that Ham could get back safe. So unlike Laika the dog, Ham the chimp survived the ordeal and splashed down in his capsule after a 16 minute long space flight. It was a milestone for the US, but the Soviets were about to attempt something remarkable that would completely overshadow Ham's achievement. The Soviets had learned a lot from their missions and now they would attempt their next big logical step. They would put a person into space. The 27 year old Yuri Gagarin had been born in a tiny rural village and trained as a factory worker before joining the Air Force. Now this lad from rural Smolensk had trained as a cosmonaut and been picked from 157 applicants to attempt the first manned spaceflight. He was loaded aboard the Vostok 1 spacecraft and on the launch pad you can only imagine his thoughts as he sat inside a capsule strapped to a rocket packed with hundreds of tons of fuel. On the 12th of April 1961, Yuri made his last transmission home. Off we go, until we meet soon, dear friends, he said. The Vostok 1 roared to life. Soaring up into space, Gagarin completed a 108 minute flight in which he orbited the Earth and returned home alive. This made Gagarin the first cosmonaut and the first man into space. Gagarin immediately became a hero within the Soviet Union and a household name internationally. He was the perfect poster boy for the Soviet Union. Young, with a charming smile and great media presence, came a worldwide celebrity and the success was a massive, massive victory for the Soviet space program. Now it rocked NASA to its core and the American public were upset. And one man in particular took the news badly. He smashed his fist down on a table so hard that a nearby NASA public relations officer feared he might have shattered his hand. That man's name was Alan Shepard. An American astronaut who had been training to complete the first manned flight into space, but the flight had been scheduled for April 1960, and then postponed six times to May 1961. Gagarin and the Russians beat NASA and Shepard to the prize by just 23 days. And at this point in the space race, the Soviet Union was firmly in the lead over the United States, and discontent within the American government was growing. If the Soviet Union continued to dominate in space, the scientific developments that resulted might end in a communist victory for the whole Cold War. So something drastic had to be done, and the concern went all the way to the top. The result in America was that the new President Kennedy began organising an effort to surpass the Soviet Union in whatever areas of space were left unconquered. It was determined that a space laboratory would be too difficult to complete before the USSR's own station was built, and orbiting the moon before the Soviets would likely be too difficult as well. So instead, Kennedy made the decision to land on the moon itself. Now, although it would be the most difficult and expensive option, it was also the one that the Americans had the best chance of beating the Soviets to, and would arguably be the most symbolic victory. In May 1961, he gave a speech to Congress in which he argued that the United States should land a man on the moon and get him home safely before the decade was out. Now, support was mixed until September 1962, when he gave a now famous speech in Texas. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. 
because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. The Americans had committed, but the Soviets were still in the lead. On the 16th of June 1963, Valentina Tereshkova became the first woman ever to fly to space, further cementing the Soviet lead in the early days of the space race. She flew a mission that lasted over three days and served as a symbol of the Soviet Union's dedication to the advancement of women as well as men. And by the middle of the decade, these small forays into space were no longer the scientific breakthroughs they had been at the beginning. Both the United States and the USSR began exploring the possibility of sending more people into space in multi-crew missions. And the Soviets began the Vokshod program, in which a spaceship would carry multiple cosmonauts on extended space voyages. Now, one particularly notable innovation was the inflatable airlock, which allowed the first human to actually leave their vessel and conduct a spacewalk. On the 18th of March 1965, the Soviet Union again found interstellar glory when cosmonaut Alexei Leonov left his ship and spent 12 minutes in the cosmic void. In many ways, this would be the last great triumph of the Soviet space program. There would be future successes, such as landing robots on the moon and space stations, but this would be the last time that the Soviet Union was in a position that was clearly superior to their rivals in the United States. And while the Soviet Union had enjoyed its successes in the space race so far, it just did not have a match for America's economic might. Now, the possibility of the Soviets reaching the moon first, and therefore cementing the idea of communist dominance in space, had frightened the American government into action since the early 1960s. Now, at the same time that the Soviets were conducting experiments with its Vokshod spacecraft, the Americans were conducting the Gemini program. The goals were similar to those of the Soviet Union in that they wanted to design a spacecraft that would be capable of holding multiple crew for an extended period of time. $1.3 billion was spent on this program and the results were excellent. Now, Building on the success of the Mercury program that had taken American astronauts like John Glenn and Alan Shepard finally to space, the Gemini spacecraft were designed and constructed by 1963 and were ready for manned missions by 1965. In June that same year, Ed White became the first American to conduct a spacewalk, only two months after the communists had done it. Now the gap had been closed, and it was now clear that the Americans were pulling ahead in the space race. After the Gemini program came the Apollo program, which was intended to take men beyond the Earth's orbit and to the moon itself. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union was still planning on its own moon mission, Faith in Soviet scientists never disappeared among the people and the political class in the USSR. The unmanned space probe Luna 9 was able to successfully land on the moon, proving that the capability existed for a safe landing. Our cosmonaut Alexei Leonov, the same man that had conducted the first spacewalk, was selected by the USSR to be the first man to land on the moon, and confidence was high that he would be able to achieve it. In 1967, he was recruited to train for the lunar landing. Now, despite the optimism that had existed in the political sphere, he was not so confident that the Soviet moon mission would be a success. Now, he would later say that our people were convinced that we would be the first to land on the moon because they were used to the fact that we were always the first. But only we, the cosmonauts, and especially the moon crew, understood that this was not going to happen. It was not character, it was funding that played a role here. We knew that the US had invested $25 billion, and we had invested 2.5 billion rubles in the entire space program for both manned and unmanned flights. And this was 10 times less. Now, the cosmonauts had not necessarily given up. It was still understood that the Soviet Union had the capability to orbit their men around the moon and could have done so more than six months before the Americans were able to reach the surface. This wouldn't have been a moon landing, but it would have at least kept the Soviet Union in the race and cemented their ability to launch further missions. But unfortunately for the cosmonauts, this would never come to pass either. Now the mission to orbit the moon did not take place, and the American Apollo 8 would be the first spacecraft to reach the moon in 1968. Its three-man crew of Frank Borman, James Lovell, and William Anders were the first men to orbit the moon, and they paved the way for the lunar landings that would take place the next year. The now famous photograph, Earthrise, was also taken during this mission and became popular across the entire world. 
Leonov blamed the lack of progress on the chief designer of the spacecraft, Vasily Pavlovich Mishin. And certainly, he said, it was only the indecisiveness of our chief designer at the time that caused us to fall behind in this program. I can say with complete confidence that if Sergei Pavlovich Korolev was alive, we would have flown around the moon six months ahead of Apollo 8. Now, Korolev was the chief Russian rocket scientist who had worked on the R7 rocket, amongst many others, and his death in 1966 was a major blow to morale. On top of this, previous mission failures had caused an attitude of caution among the Soviet space program officials. In 1967, the Soviet space program was rocked by another disaster. Cosmonaut Vladimir Kamarov's Soyuz 1 module re-entered Earth's atmosphere and smashed full speed into the ground when parachutes failed to deploy in time. Kamarov and his friend and fellow cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin had both protested the Soyuz's shoddy construction and design, but they were overruled by the Soviet leadership and Kamarov was essentially sent to his death. Gagarin and a research team had found 203 defects and faults in the Soyuz's construction, but the mission was never postponed. The disaster frightened the leadership of the Soviet space program and they slowed down their mission schedules. Now the moon seemed as far away as ever. They had the men and they had the technology, but as always it was budgets and bureaucracy that were getting in the way. Gagarin had lost his good friend, but the Soviet Union as a whole had lost something too. They just didn't know it yet. They had forfeited the chance to get to the moon and the Americans weren't going to let them catch up. And then, in 1968, the Soviet lunar program and the Union itself were dealt a major blow. Yuri Gagarin himself was killed in a routine training flight. The USSR had lost its poster boy. On the 16th of July 1969, the US launched the Apollo 11 mission that would finally put men on the moon just a few days later. That's probably one of the most significant dates in human history, as it marks the first time that human beings had walked on an interstellar body that was not our own. The Americans had come back from behind in the space race and achieved the dream of every human that had ever looked up at the night sky. And Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first men to walk on the lunar surface. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. While Michael Collins orbited above in the capsule. And back on Earth, 500 million people across the world watched the moon landing live on their televisions or listened on their radios. And though the Soviet Union knew that they would not be able to land on the moon first, there was a last ditch effort to obtain a consolation prize. Three days before the launch of Apollo 11, the unmanned Soviet Lunar 15 probe was launched to the moon. It was intended to land softly on the moon, collect a sample of the surface, and then launch back to Earth. This way, even if the USSR couldn't land a man on the moon first, they would have obtained a piece of it before the Americans could. But unfortunately for the Soviets, the mission was a failure, and Lunar 15 slammed into the moon's surface full speed and was totally destroyed. So not only had the Americans put a man on the moon first, but the mission that would have offered some degree of victory was a complete failure, adding insult to injury. The reaction to the American moon landing in the Soviet Union was mixed. On the one hand, mankind as a whole had just achieved something spectacular that would advance our species and our scientific development by untold margins. But on the other hand, national pride was severely stung. Mankind as a whole hadn't necessarily achieved this, the Americans had. There was no suppression of the news. A Soviet citizen was just as likely to know about the moon landing as anybody else, but there was a downplaying of it. The landing was shown on TV in the USSR, but most people didn't have access to one yet, so that didn't really matter. And as for the newspapers, the landing was reported, but not emphasized. There was a small article on the first page of Pravda, the Communist Party's official newspaper, and three columns on the fifth page, but it was an embarrassing, disappointing moment for communism, especially after the early lead that the USSR had in the space program. For most citizens of the Soviet Union though, the reaction was one of surprise that they had been beaten, but then life just moved on. Without the massive cultural presence of the cosmonauts on TV and in the parades, it was fairly easy to ignore the situation. And most of the people had too many problems in their own lives to worry about the Americans putting a man on the moon. Now, the Soviet government sent a short congratulatory message to the American government and then moved on, probably muttering about how it didn't even want to go to the moon in the first place. 
After the moon landing, the desire to rapidly advance lunar spaceflight in both the American and Soviet governments just about dried up. The rockets that were intended to take Soviet cosmonauts to the moon never functioned properly. The program was quietly cancelled in 1974, and the hope of landing a communist on the moon died with it. Now, the simple fact of the matter was that despite the extraordinary accomplishments of both sides during the space race, it was a massive, massive sink of money. The national pride and the desire to outdo the competition could paper over that fact for a while, but once the space race was over, there seemed little reason to continue expanding such massive resources on a project that would offer little immediate return. Now, even the American economy, which was far stronger than that of the Soviet Union, was having trouble affording the cost of this space race by the end of it. The Soviets pulled back and decided to focus instead on space laboratories. And these were very successful. And over the next few decades, five would be launched and used by Soviet crews all the way up to the collapse of the Union in 1991. Now, additionally, the end of the space race brought about a period of cooled tensions between the two sides of the Cold War. In space, this was best seen in the 1975 Apollo Soyuz mission, when a Soviet and an American spacecraft docked together and a famous handshake was shared between the two crews. Now, overall, the loss of the space race was a great disappointment to the Soviet government, but not a killing blow. Communist prestige had been damaged, and the Americans were superior in space, but the situation on the ground remained roughly as it had been. In truth, there was probably a degree of relief from both sides when the race was over. Elation from the Americans and disappointments from the Soviets, but relief from both. Now, although the first space race ended decades ago, in recent years, a new space race has begun. The idea of private spaceflight is a tantalizing one, and some of the world's richest figures have dedicated billions of dollars to chasing this dream. SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, and Blue Origin have engaged in what many have called the Billionaire's Space Race, a unique race between three private companies to send manned craft into orbit. The developments and mission statements of these three companies could see Mars colonized and affordable spaceflight become available to the public in the near future. It's an exciting time for technological development, but for decades now, many have asked if mankind would ever return to the moon. Now, the last manned lunar mission was Apollo 17, all the way back in 1972. And it will be in 2025, over half a century later, that mankind will finally return to the moon aboard the Artemis III mission. It's an exciting time for space exploration, but space flight is still full of risk and danger. In 1970, NASA almost lost an entire crew when their craft was rocked by a catastrophic failure and explosion. That was the infamous Apollo 13 flight, but that, dear time travelers, is a story for another day. Hello time travelers, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, leave a comment below and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Until next time, remember, history doesn't repeat, but it certainly echoes.